In Christianity, the Antichrist Greek, Antichristos translate. Antichristos is the antagonist of the Messiah, specifically the Christ. The term is found five times in the New Testament, solely in the first and second epistle of John once in plural form and four times in the singular. The first mention of the Antichrist appears in the first epistle of John, where he is announced as the one who denies the Father and the Son. Before announcing the Great Tribulation, Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 24 alerts his disciples not to be deceived by the false prophets, which will claim themselves as being Christ, operating great signs and wonders. One image of the Antichrist, commonly understood to rise in power in the last days and often associated with the little horn in Daniel's final vision, is found as the man of sin. In Paul the Apostle's second epistle to the Thessalonians, in Islamic eschatology, al masi ad-Dajjal Amzi al-Jal is an anti-Messiah figure similar to the Christian concept of an Antichrist, who will appear to deceive humanity before the second coming of Isa, as Jesus is known by Muslims. The concept of an Antichrist is absent in traditional Judaism, although in some medieval texts the symbolic figure Armalus appears. Etymology The word antichrist combines two roots, anti anti plus Christos Christus. Anti can mean not only against and opposite of, but also in place of. Topic. Christian views Topic. New Testament Whether the New Testament contains an individual Antichrist is disputed. The Greek term Antichristus originates in 1 John. The similar term Pseudochristus, false messiah, is also first found in the New Testament, and, for example, never used by Josephus in his accounts of various false messiahs. The concept of an Antichristus is not found in Jewish writings in the period 500 BC to 50 AD. However, Bernard McGinn conjectures that the concept may have been generated by the frustration of Jews subject to often capricious Seleucid or Roman rule, who found the nebulous Jewish idea of a Satan who is more of an opposing angel of God in the heavenly court insufficiently humanized and personalized to be a satisfactory incarnation of evil and threat. The five uses of the term Antichrist or Antichrists in the Johannine epistles do not clearly present a single latter day individual Antichrist. The articles, the deceiver, or the antichrist, are usually seen as marking out a certain category of persons, rather than an individual. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that antichrist cometh, even now there are become many antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last hour. Many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. By this you know the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the Spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. Consequently, attention for an individual Antichrist figure focuses on the second chapter of 2 Thessalonians. However, the term, Antichrist, is never used in this passage. As to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we beg you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as though from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord is already here. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the lawless one is revealed, the one destined for destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but only until the one who now restrains it is removed. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will destroy with the breath of his mouth, annihilating him by the manifestation of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is apparent in the working of Satan, who uses all power, signs, lying wonders, and every kind of wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Although the word, Antichrist, Greek Antichristus, is used only in the epistles of John, the similar word, Pseudochrist 
Greek pseudochristus, meaning false messiah, is used by Jesus in the Gospels. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and produce great signs and omens, to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Early Church The only one of the late 1st, early 2nd century apostolic fathers to use the term is Polycarp c. 69 c. 155 who warned the Philippians that everyone who preached false doctrine was an antichrist. His use of the term antichrist follows that of the New Testament in not identifying a single personal antichrist, but a class of people, Irenaeus 2nd century AD, c. 202 wrote against heresies to refute the teachings of the Gnostics. In Book V of Against Heresies he addresses the figure of the Antichrist referring to him as the "...recapitulation of apostasy and rebellion." He uses "...666," the number of the beast from Revelation chapter 13 verse 18, to numerologically decode several possible names. Some names that he loosely proposed were "...Avanthos," "...Latinos," "...Latin," or pertaining to the Roman Empire. In his exegesis of Daniel chapter 7 verse 21, he stated that the ten horns of the beast will be the Roman Empire divided into ten kingdoms before the Antichrist's arrival. However, his readings of the Antichrist were more in broader theological terms rather than within a historical context. The non canonical ascension of Isaiah presents a detailed exposition of the Antichrist as Belial and Nero, Tertullian. C. 160 c. 220 AD held that the Roman Empire was the restraining force written about by Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 7 to 8. The fall of the Western Roman Empire and the disintegration of the 10 provinces of the Roman Empire into 10 kingdoms were to make way for the antichrist. By for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. He Paul means indeed this present empire and the man of lawlessness is revealed. That is to say, the Antichrist, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called god or religion, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. Do you not remember that I told you these things when I was still with you? And you know what is now restraining him, so that he may be revealed when his time comes. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, but only until the one who now restrains it is removed. What obstacles are there but the Roman state, the rebellion of which, by being scattered into the Ten Kingdoms, will introduce the Antichrist upon its own ruins? And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will destroy with the breath of his mouth, annihilating him by the manifestation of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is apparent in the working of Satan, who uses all power, signs, lying wonders, and every kind of wicked deception for those who are perishing. Hippolytus of Rome c. 170 c. 236 held that the Antichrist would come from the tribe of Dan and would rebuild the Jewish temple on the Temple Mount in order to reign from it. He identified the Antichrist with the beast out of the earth from the book of Revelation. By the beast, then, coming up out of the earth, he means the kingdom of Antichrist, and by the two horns he means him and the false prophet after him. And in speaking of horns like a lamb, he means that he will make himself like the Son of God, and set himself forward as king. And the terms, it spoke like a dragon, mean that he is a deceiver, and not truthful. Origen 185-254 refuted Celsus's view of the Antichrist. Origen utilized scriptural citations from Daniel, Paul, and the Gospels. He argued, Where is the absurdity, then, in holding that there exist among men, so to speak, two extremes, the one of virtue, and the other of its opposite, so that the perfection of virtue dwells in the man who realizes the ideal given in Jesus, from whom there flowed to the human race so great a conversion, and healing, and amelioration, while the opposite extreme is in the man who embodies the notion of him that is named Antichrist? One of these extremes, and the best of the two, should be styled the Son of God, on account of his pre-eminence, and the other, who is diametrically opposite, be termed the Son of the wicked demon, and of Satan, and of the devil. And, in the next place, since evil is specially characterized by its diffusion, and attains its greatest height when it simulates the appearance of the good, for that reason are signs, and marvels, and lying miracles found to accompany evil, through the cooperation of its father the devil. Post-Nicene Christianity 
Cyril of Jerusalem, in the mid-4th century, delivered his 15th catechetical lecture about the second coming of Jesus Christ, in which he also lectures about the Antichrist, who will reign as the ruler of the world for three and a half years, before he is killed by Jesus Christ right at the end of his three and a half year reign, shortly after which the second coming of Jesus Christ will happen. Athanasius of Alexandria c. 298 wrote that Arius of Alexandria is to be associated with the Antichrist, saying, "...and ever since the Council of Nicaea has Arius's error been reckoned for a heresy more than ordinary, being known as Christ's foe, and harbinger of Antichrist." John Chrysostom c. 347 warned against speculating about the Antichrist, saying, "...let us not therefore inquire into these things." He preached that by knowing Paul's description of the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians, Christians would avoid deception. Jerome c. 347-420 warned that those substituting false interpretations for the actual meaning of Scripture belong to the synagogue of the Antichrist. He that is not of Christ is of Antichrist. He wrote to Pope Damasus I he believed that the mystery of lawlessness written about by Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7 was already in action when every one chatters about his views to Jerome the power restraining this mystery of lawlessness was the Roman empire but as it fell this restraining force was removed he warned a noble woman of Gaul he that let this taken out of the way and yet we do not realize that antichrist is near yes antichrist is near whom the lord jesus christ shall consume with the spirit of his mouth Woe unto them, he cries, that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Savage tribes in countless numbers have overrun all parts of Gaul. The whole country between the Alps and the Pyrenees, between the Rhine and the ocean, has been laid waste by hordes of Quadi, Vandals, Sarmatians, Alans, Gepids, Herules, Saxons, Burgundians, Alemanni, and alas for the Commonwealth even Pannonians. In his commentary on Daniel, Jerome noted, "...let us not follow the opinion of some commentators and suppose him to be either the devil or some demon, but rather, one of the human race, in whom Satan will wholly take up his residence in bodily form." Instead of rebuilding the Jewish temple to reign from, Jerome thought the Antichrist sat in God's temple in Asmach as he made "...himself out to be like God." He refuted Porphyry's idea that the "...little horn." Mentioned in Daniel chapter 7 was Antiochus IV Epiphanes by noting that the little horn is defeated by an eternal, universal ruler, right before the final judgment. Instead, he advocated that the little horn was the Antichrist. We should therefore concur with the traditional interpretation of all the commentators of the Christian Church, that at the end of the world, when the Roman Empire is to be destroyed, there shall be ten kings who will partition the Roman world amongst themselves. Then an insignificant eleventh king will arise, who will overcome three of the ten kings. After they have been slain, the seven other kings also will bow their necks to the victor. Circa 380, an apocalyptic pseudo-prophecy falsely attributed to the Tiburtine Sibyl describes Constantine as victorious over Gog and Magog. Later on, it predicts, when the Roman Empire shall have ceased, then the Antichrist will be openly revealed and will sit in the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. While he is reigning, two very famous men, Elijah and Enoch, will go forth to announce the coming of the Lord. Antichrist will kill them and after three days they will be raised up by the Lord. Then there will be a great persecution, such as has not been before nor shall be thereafter. The Lord will shorten those days for the sake of the elect, and the Antichrist will be slain by the power of God through Michael the Archangel on the Mount of Olives. Augustine of Hippo 354 wrote. It is uncertain in what temple the Antichrist shall sit, whether in that ruin of the temple which was built by Solomon, or in the church. Pope Gregory I wrote to the Byzantine Emperor Maurice in AD 597, concerning the titles of bishops, I say with confidence that whoever calls or desires to call himself universal priest in self-exaltation of himself as a precursor of the Antichrist. By the end of the 10th century, Adza of Montier and Dur, a Benedictine monk, compiled a biography of Antichrist based on a variety of exegetical and sibylline sources. His account became one of the best known descriptions of Antichrist in the Middle Ages. <laughs> Pre Reformation Western Church accusers 
Arnulf, Archbishop of Reims disagreed with the policies and morals of Pope John XV. He expressed his views while presiding over the Council of Reims in AD 991. Arnulf accused John XV of being the Antichrist while also using the Second Thessalonians passage about the man of lawlessness or lawless one, saying, Surely, if he is empty of charity and filled with vain knowledge and lifted up, he is Antichrist sitting in God's temple and showing himself as God. This incident is history's earliest record of anyone identifying a pope with the Antichrist. See Christian historicism. Pope Gregory VII, c. 1015 or 1029 to 1085, struggled against, in his own words, a robber of temples, a perjurer against the Holy Roman Church, notorious throughout the whole Roman world for the basest of crimes, namely Wilbert, plunderer of the Holy Church of Ravenna, Antichrist, and arch heretic. Cardinal Benno, on the opposite side of the investiture controversy, wrote long descriptions of abuses committed by Gregory VII, including necromancy, torture of a former friend upon a bed of nails, commissioning an attempted assassination, executions without trials, unjust excommunication, doubting the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, and even burning it. Benno held that Gregory VII was either a member of Antichrist, or Antichrist himself. Eberhard II von Trutschsees, Prince Archbishop of Salzburg in 1241, denounced Pope Gregory IX at the Council of Regensburg as "...that man of perdition, whom they call Antichrist, who in his extravagant boasting says, I am God, I cannot err." He argued that the ten kingdoms that the Antichrist is involved with were the Turks, Greeks, Egyptians, Africans, Spaniards, French, English, Germans, Sicilians, and Italians who now occupy the provinces of Rome. He held that the papacy was the little horn of Daniel chapter 7 verse 8. A little horn has grown up with eyes and mouth speaking great things, which is reducing three of these kingdoms i.e. Sicily, Italy, and Germany to subserviency, is persecuting the people of Christ and the saints of God with intolerable opposition, is confounding things human and divine, and is attempting things unutterable, execrable. <laughs> Protestant Reformation Protestant reformers, including John Wycliffe, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Thomas Cranmer, John Thomas, John Knox, Roger Williams, Cotton Mather, and John Wesley, as well as most Protestants of the 16th–18th centuries, felt that the early Church had been led into the Great Apostasy by the Papacy and identified the Pope with the Antichrist. The Centuriators of Magdeburg, a group of Lutheran scholars in Magdeburg headed by Matthias Flacius, wrote the twelve-volume Magdeburg Centuries to discredit the Catholic Church and lead other Christians to recognize the Pope as the Antichrist. So, rather than expecting a single Antichrist to rule the earth during a future tribulation period, Martin Luther, John Calvin, and other Protestant reformers saw the Antichrist as a present feature in the world of their time, fulfilled in the papacy. Among the others who interpreted the biblical prophecy historistically, there were many church fathers. Justin Martyr wrote about the Antichrist. He whom Daniel foretells would have dominion for a time and times and an half, is even now at the door. Irenaeus wrote in Against Heresies about the coming of the Antichrist, this Antichrist shall devastate all things. But then, the Lord will come from heaven on the clouds for the righteous. Tertullian looking to the Antichrist wrote, He is to sit in the temple of God, and boast himself as being God. In our view, he is Antichrist as taught us in both the ancient and the new prophecies, and especially by the Apostle John, who says that already many false prophets are gone out into the world as the forerunners of Antichrist. Quote dot. Hippolytus of Rome in his treatise on Christ and Antichrist wrote, as Daniel also says in the words, I considered the beast, and look. There were ten horns behind it, among which shall rise another horn, an offshoot, and shall pluck up by the roots the three that were before it, and under this, was signified none other than Antichrist. Quote, Athanasius of Alexandria clearly hold to the historical view in his many writings, in the deposition of Arius, he wrote. I addressed the letter to Arius and his fellows, exhorting them to renounce his impiety. There have gone forth in this diocese at this time certain lawless men, enemies of Christ, teaching an apostasy which one may justly suspect and designate as a forerunner of Antichrist. Jerome wrote, 
says the apostle Paul in the second epistle to the Thessalonians, unless the Roman Empire should first be desolated, and Antichrist proceed, Christ will not come. Quote, he also identifies the little horn of Daniel chapter 7 verse 8 and 7:24-25, which shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law as the papacy. Some Franciscans had considered the Emperor Frederick II a positive antichrist who would purify the Catholic Church from opulence, riches and clergy. Some of the debated features of the Reformation's historicist interpretations reached beyond the Book of Revelation. They included the identification of the Antichrist 1 and 2 John, the Beast of Revelation chapter 13, the Man of Sin, or Man of Lawlessness, of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2-1-12, the Little Horn, of Daniel 7 and 8, the Abomination of Desolation of Daniel 9, 11, and 12, and the Whore of Babylon of Revelation chapter 17, the Protestant reformers tended to hold the belief that the Antichrist power would be revealed so that everyone would comprehend and recognize that the Pope is the real, true Antichrist and not the Vicar of Christ. Doctrinal works of literature published by the Lutherans, the Reformed Churches, the Presbyterians, the Baptists, the Anabaptists, and the Methodists contain references to the Pope as the Antichrist, including the Smallcald Articles, Article 4 1537, the Treatise on the Power and Primacy of the Pope written by Philip Melanchthon 1537, the Westminster Confession, Article 25.6 1646, and the 1689 Baptist Confession of Faith, Article 26.4. In 1754, John Wesley published his explanatory notes upon the New Testament, which is currently an official doctrinal standard of the United Methodist Church. In his notes on the Book of Revelation, chapter 13, he commented, "The whole succession of popes from Gregory the Seventh are undoubtedly antichrists. Yet this hinders not, but that the last pope in this succession will be more eminently the antichrist, the man of sin, adding to that of his predecessors a peculiar degree of wickedness from the bottomless pit." In calling the pope the antichrist, the early Lutherans stood in a tradition that reached back into the 11th century. Not only dissidents and heretics but even saints had called the bishop of Rome the antichrist when they wished to castigate his abuse of power. What Lutherans understood as a papal claim to unlimited authority over everything and everyone reminded them of the apocalyptic imagery of Daniel 11, a passage that even prior to the Reformation had been applied to the Pope as the Antichrist of the last days. The identification of the Pope with the Antichrist was so ingrained in the Reformation era, that Luther himself stated it repeatedly. This teaching of the supremacy of the Pope shows forcefully that the Pope is the very Antichrist, who has exalted himself above, and opposed himself against Christ, because he will not permit Christians to be saved without his power, which, nevertheless, is nothing, and is neither ordained nor commanded by God, and nothing else than the kingdom of Babylon and of the very Antichrist. For who is the man of sin and the son of perdition, but he who by his teaching and his ordinances increases the sin and perdition of souls in the church, while he yet sits in the church as if he were God? All these conditions have now for many ages been fulfilled by the papal tyranny." John Calvin similarly wrote, Though it be admitted that Rome was once the mother of all churches, yet from the time when it began to be the seat of Antichrist it has ceased to be what it was before. Some persons think us too severe and censorious when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. But those who are of this opinion do not consider that they bring the same charge of presumption against Paul himself, after whom we speak and whose language we adopt. I shall briefly show that Paul's words in 2 Thess. 2 are not capable of any other interpretation than that which applies them to the papacy. John Knox wrote on the Pope. Yea, to speak it in plain words, lest that we submit ourselves to Satan, thinking that we submit ourselves to Jesus Christ, for, as for your Roman Kirk, as it is now corrupted, and the authority thereof, whereon stands the hope of your victory, I no more doubt but that it is the synagogue of Satan, and the head thereof, called the Pope, to be that man of sin, of whom the Apostle speaks." Thomas Cranmer on the Antichrist wrote. Whereof it followeth Rome to be the seat of Antichrist, and the Pope to be very Antichrist himself. 
I could prove the same by many other scriptures, old writers, and strong reasons." John Wesley, speaking of the identity given in the Bible of the Antichrist, wrote, "...in many respects, the Pope has an indisputable claim to those titles. He is, in an emphatical sense, the man of sin, as he increases all manner of sin above measure." And he is, too, properly styled, the son of perdition, as he has caused the death of numberless multitudes, both of his opposers and followers, destroyed innumerable souls, and will himself perish everlastingly. He it is that opposeth himself to the emperor, once his rightful sovereign, and that exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, commanding angels, and putting kings under his feet, both of whom are called gods in scripture, claiming the highest power, the highest honor, suffering himself, not once only, to be styled God or vice-God. Indeed no less is implied in his ordinary title, Most Holy Lord, or Most Holy Father so that he sitteth, enthroned, in the temple of God, mentioned Rev. She, 1. Declaring himself that he is God, claiming the prerogatives which belong to God alone." Roger Williams wrote about the Pope, The pretended vicar of Christ on earth, who sits as God over the temple of God, exalting himself not only above all that is called God, but over the souls and consciences of all his vassals, yea over the Spirit of Christ, over the Holy Spirit, yea, and God himself. Speaking against the God of heaven, thinking to change times and laws, but he is the son of perdition. The identification of the Roman Catholic Church as the apostate power written of in the Bible as the Antichrist became evident to many as the Reformation began, including John Wycliffe, who was well known throughout Europe for his opposition to the doctrine and practices of the Catholic Church, which he believed had clearly deviated from the original teachings of the early Church and to be contrary to the Bible. Wycliffe himself tells Sermons, 3, 199 how he concluded that there was a great contrast between what the Church was and what it ought to be, and saw the necessity for reform. Along with John Huss, they had started the inclination toward ecclesiastical reforms of the Catholic Church. When the Swiss reformer Huldrych Zwingli became the pastor of the Grossmünster in Zurich 1518, he began to preach ideas on reforming the Catholic Church. Zwingli, who was a Catholic priest before he became a reformer, often referred to the Pope as the Antichrist. He wrote, I know that in it works the might and power of the devil, that is, of the Antichrist. The English reformer William Tyndale held that while the Roman Catholic realms of that age were the empire of Antichrist, any religious organization that distorted the doctrine of the Old and New Testaments also showed the work of Antichrist. In his treatise The Parable of the Wicked Mammon, he expressly rejected the established church teaching that looked to the future for an antichrist to rise up, and he taught that antichrist is a present spiritual force that will be with us until the end of the age under different religious disguises from time to time. Tyndall's translation of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, concerning the man of lawlessness, reflected his understanding, but was significantly amended by later revisers, including the King James Bible Committee, which followed the Vulgate more closely. In 1870, the newly formed Kingdom of Italy annexed the remaining Papal States, depriving the Pope of his temporal power. However, the Papal rule over Italy was later restored by the Italian fascist regime albeit on a greatly diminished scale in 1929 as head of the Vatican City State. Under Mussolini's dictatorship, Roman Catholicism became the state religion of fascist Italy see also clerical fascism, and the racial laws were enforced to outlaw and persecute both Italian Jews and Protestant Christians, especially Evangelicals and Pentecostals. Thousands of Italian Jews and a small number of Protestants died in the Nazi concentration camps. Today, many Protestant and Restorationist denominations still officially maintain that the papacy is the Antichrist, such as the conservative Lutheran churches and the Seventh day Adventists. In 1988, Ian Paisley, evangelical minister and founder of the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster, made headlines with such a statement about Pope John Paul II. The Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod states about the Pope and the Catholic Church, There are two principles that mark the papacy as the Antichrist. One is that the Pope takes to himself the right to rule the Church that belongs only to Christ. He can make laws forbidding the marriage of priests, eating or not eating meat on Friday, birth control, divorce and remarriage, even where there are not such laws in the Bible. The second is that he teaches that salvation is not by faith alone but by faith and works. The present Pope upholds and practices these principles. 
This marks his rule as anti-Christian rule in the Church. All popes hold the same office over the Church and promote the same anti-Christian belief so they all are part of the reign of the Antichrist. The Bible does not present the Antichrist as one man for one short time, but as an office held by a man through successive generations. It is a title like King of England. Topic Roman Catholicism Fulton J. Sheen, a Roman Catholic bishop, wrote in 1951, The Antichrist will not be so called, otherwise he would have no followers, he will come disguised as the great humanitarian, he will talk peace, prosperity and plenty not as means to lead us to God, but as ends in themselves. He will tempt Christians with the same three temptations with which he tempted Christ. He will have one great secret which he will tell to no one, he will not believe in God. Because his religion will be brotherhood without the fatherhood of God, he will deceive even the elect. He will set up a counterchurch. It will have all the notes and characteristics of the church, but in reverse and emptied of its divine content. It will be a mystical body of the Antichrist that will in all externals resemble the mystical body of Christ. In the Counter-Reformation, preterism and futurism, was advanced by Catholic Jesuits beginning in the 16th century in response to the identification of the papacy as Antichrist. These were rival methods of prophetic interpretation, the futurist and the preterist systems both of which are in conflict with the historicist method and the interpretations derived thereby. Historically, preterists and non-preterists have generally agreed that the Jesuit Luis de Alcácer wrote the first systematic preterist exposition of prophecy, Vestigatio Arcani Census in Apocalypse published in 1614, during the Counter-Reformation. Preterism interprets the Book of Daniel as referring to events of the past, that happened in the 2nd century BC, while seeing the prophecies in the Book of Revelation as events that happened in the 1st century AD. Preterism holds that ancient Israel finds its continuation or fulfillment in the Christian Church at the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. The view of futurism, that the events happen in the end time, was advanced by Francisco Ribera, a Jesuit priest, who developed this theory in In Sacrum Beati Ioannis Apostoli, an Evangelistiae Apocalypse and Commentarige, his 1585 treatise on the Book of Revelation. Saint Robert Bellarmine codified this view, giving in full the Catholic theory set forth by the Greek and Latin fathers, of a personal Antichrist to come just before the end of the world and to be accepted by the Jews and enthroned in the Temple at Jerusalem, thus endeavouring to dispose of the exposition which saw Antichrist in the Pope. Most premillennial dispensationalists now accept Bellarmine's interpretation in modified form. Widespread Protestant identification of the papacy as the Antichrist persisted in the USA until the early 1900s when the Schofield Reference Bible was published by Cyrus Schofield. This commentary promoted futurism, causing a decline in the Protestant identification of the papacy as Antichrist. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states, 675 before Christ's second coming the Church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. 676 The Antichrist's deception already begins to take shape in the world every time the claim is made to realize within history that messianic hope which can only be realized beyond history through the eschatological judgment. The Church has rejected even modified forms of this falsification of the kingdom to come under the name of millenarianism, especially the intrinsically perverse political form of a secular messianism. Topic. Old believers. After Patriarch Nikon of Moscow reformed the Russian Orthodox Church during the second half of the 17th century, a large number of old believers held that Peter the Great, the Tsar of the Russian Empire until his death in 1725, was the Antichrist because of his treatment of the Orthodox Church, namely subordinating the Church to the state, requiring clergymen to conform to the standards of all Russian civilians shaved beards, being fluent in French, and requiring them to pay state taxes. Topic. Age of Enlightenment Bernard McGinn noted that complete denial of the Antichrist was rare until the Age of Enlightenment. Following frequent use of Antichrist laden rhetoric during religious controversies in the 17th century, the use of the concept declined in the 18th century. 
Subsequent 18th century efforts to cleanse Christianity of legendary or folk accretions effectively removed the Antichrist from discussion in mainstream Western churches. Mormonism In Mormonism, the Antichrist is anyone or anything that counterfeits the true gospel or plan of salvation and that openly or secretly is set up in opposition to Christ. The great Antichrist is Lucifer, but he has many assistants both as spirit beings and as mortals. Latter day saints use the New Testament scriptures, 1 John 2, verses 18, 22, 1 John 4, verses 3 6, 2 John 1, verse 7, and the Book of Mormon, Jacob 7 1 23, Alma 1 2 16, Alma 30 6 60, in their exegesis or interpretation of the Antichrist. Seventh-day Adventists Seventh-day Adventists teach that the "'little horn power' which, as predicted in the Book of Daniel, rose after the breakup of the Roman Empire, is the papacy. In 533, Justinian I, the emperor of the Byzantine Empire sometimes referred to as the Eastern Roman Empire, legally recognized the bishop Pope of Rome as the head of all the Christian churches. Because of the Arian domination of some of the Roman Empire by barbarian tribes, the Bishop of Rome could not fully exercise such authority. In 538, Belisarius, one of Justinian's generals, freed the city of Rome from its Arian barbarian Ostrogoth besiegers and the Bishop of Rome could begin establishing universal civil authority. So, by the military intervention of the Eastern Roman Empire, the Bishop of Rome became all-powerful throughout the area of the Old Roman Empire. Like many Reformation-era Protestant leaders, the Adventist pioneer Ellen G. White (1827–1915) spoke of the Catholic Church as a fallen church in preparation for its nefarious eschatological role as the antagonist against God's true Church, and saw the Pope as the Antichrist. Protestant reformers such as Martin Luther, John Knox, William Tyndale, and others held similar beliefs about the Catholic Church and the papacy when they broke away from the Catholic Church during the Reformation. Ellen White writes. His word has given warning of the impending danger, let this be unheeded, and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are, only when it is too late to escape the snare. She is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, in the churches, and in the hearts of men. She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. Stealthily and unsuspectedly she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. All that she desires is vantage ground, and this is already being given her. We shall soon see and shall feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur reproach and persecution. Seventh-day Adventists view the length of time the apostate church's unbridled power was permitted to rule as shown in Daniel chapter 7 verse 25. The little horn would rule a time and times and half a time, or 1,260 years. They regard papal rule as supreme in Europe from 538, when the Arian Ostrogoths retreated from Rome into temporary oblivion, until 1798, when the French general Louis Alexander Berthier took Pope Pius VI captive, a period of 1,260 years. Topic: Other Christian interpretations. Martin White Devout Christian and political theorist Martin White, writing immediately after World War II, favored the revival of the Antichrist doctrine, not as a person, but as a recurrent situation featuring demonic concentrations of power. As man of lawlessness The Antichrist has been equated with the man of lawlessness or lawless one of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3 though commentaries on the identity of the man of lawlessness greatly vary the man of lawlessness has been identified with Caligula Nero and the end times antichrist some scholars believe that the passage contains no genuine prediction but represents a speculation of the apostles own based on contemporary ideas of the antichrist Topic. As being in league with other figures. 
Several American evangelical and fundamentalist theologians, including Cyrus Schofield, have identified the Antichrist as being in league with or the same as several figures in the Book of Revelation including the dragon or serpent, the beast, the false prophet, and the whore of Babylon. Voices in the emerging church, such as Rob Bell, reject the identification of the Antichrist with any one person or group. They believe a loving Christ would not view anyone as an enemy. Topic: As Satan Bernard McGinn described multiple traditions detailing the relationship between the Antichrist and Satan. In the dualist approach, Satan will become incarnate in the Antichrist, just as God became incarnate in Jesus. However, in Orthodox Christian thought, this view was problematic because it was too similar to Christ's incarnation. Instead, the indwelling view became more accepted. It stipulates that the Antichrist is a human figure inhabited by Satan, since the latter's power is not to be seen as equivalent to God's. Non-Christian views Judaism <inaudible> 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 There are warnings against false prophets in the Hebrew Bible, but no personal anti-Messiah figure, a parodic anti-Messiah type figure known as Armalus, said to be the offspring of Satan and a virgin, appears in some non-legalistic, philosophical schools of Jewish eschatology, such as the 7th century CE Sefer Zerubbabel and 11th century CE Midrash Vayosha also, Midrash Wa Yosha. He is described as a monstrosity, bald-headed, with one large and one small eye, deaf in the right ear and maimed in the right arm, while the left arm is two and one half ells long." Being Gog's successor, his inevitable destruction by a Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah, son of Joseph, son of Jacob, symbolizes the ultimate victory of good over evil in the Messianic age. This is confronted with the medieval Christian Antichrist and Islamic Dajjal, who will conquer Jerusalem and persecute the Jews. Islam Al-Masih ad-Dajjal Arabic, Al-Jal literally, the deceiving messiah, is an evil figure in Islamic eschatology. Although not mentioned in the Quran the details of his coming and life is explicitly mentioned in the authentic hadith hence Muslims believe he is to appear pretending to be the messiah then God at a time in the future, before Yom al qiyama the day of resurrection, judgment day. He will travel around the globe entering every city except Mecca, Medina, Mount Sinai and Jerusalem. Then Isa Jesus will descend from the sky to the white minaret commonly held as being in the Umayyad Mosque east of Damascus as referred to in Hadith, placing his hands on the backs of two angels, at the time of the Farj dawn prayer. This will happen at the time of the Dajjal and Isa Jesus will be the one to eventually defeat the Dajjal. See also, Dajjal in Ahmadiyya Islam Prophecies concerning the emergence of the Antichrist al -Masiyad Dajjal are interpreted in Ahmadiyya teachings as designating a specific group of nations centered upon falsehood instead of an individual, with the reference to the Antichrist as an individual indicating its unity as a class or system rather than its personal individuality. As such, Ahmadi Muslims identify the Antichrist collectively with the missionary expansion and colonial dominance of European Christianity throughout the world that was propelled by the Industrial Revolution. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad wrote extensively on this topic identifying the Antichrist principally with colonial missionaries who, according to him, were to be countered through argumentation rather than by physical warfare, and whose power and influence was to wane gradually. While the term Dajjal is taken as a reference to the forces of falsehood in matters of ideology and religious belief, prophecies concerning Gog and Magog or Ya Juj Ma Juj are taken as relating to the duplicity in the realm of politics and the shattering of world peace by the same forces, whose ancestors are thought to be the Slavic and Teutonic peoples, and are seen as embodied by the political dominance of European powers. The conflict between Russia and the United States as two superpowers, or the militant rivalry between the communist and capitalist systems and their impact over the nations of the world, are thus seen as having occurred in accordance with prophecies concerning Gog and Magog. These powers cannot be defeated through military force and are to be overcome through prayer and divine intervention. Islam is then seen as that which alone would succeed in bringing people of different nations together as per the Quran 18 
Topic Bahai the Antichrist is considered to subvert the religion of God from the inner reality of man as Abdul Baha narrates Christ was a divine center of unity and love Whenever discord prevails instead of unity, wherever hatred and antagonism take the place of love and spiritual fellowship, Antichrist reigns instead of Christ. Topic in popular culture on February 1900, the Christian Russian philosopher and mystic Vladimir Solovyov published the apocalyptic A Short Tale of the Antichrist, showing his prophetic vision about the incoming 20th century and the end of the human history. The Antichrist is prophetized as a lawyer which will present himself to the whole humanity like a pacifist, ecologist and ecumenist, will convoke an ecumenical council and will seek the consensus of all the Christian confessions, granting something to each one. Topic see also topic References topic Bibliography Fox, John 1583. The Acts and Monuments, Book 2. Retrieved 6 June 2010. Jerome 1893 347-420. Letter to Pope Damasus. In Schaff, Philip. A Select Library of Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers of the Christian Church, Second Series. V. Henry Wace. New York, The Christian Literature Company. p. 19. Retrieved 7 June 2010. Jerome 1893b 347-420. The Dialogue Against the Luciferians. In Schaff, Philip. A Select Library of Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers of the Christian Church, 2nd Series. V. Henry Wace. New York, The Christian Literature Company. p. 334. Retrieved 7 June 2010. Jerome 1893c 347-420. Against the Pelagians, Book 1. In Schaff, Philip. A Select Library of Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers of the Christian Church, 2nd Series. V. Henry Wace. New York, The Christian Literature Company. p. 449. Retrieved 7 June 2010. Jerome 1893d 347-420. Letter to Agaruchia. In Schaff, Philip. A Select Library of Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers of the Christian Church, 2nd Series. V. Henry Wace. New York, The Christian Literature Company. pp. 236-7. Retrieved 8 June 2010. Jerome 1958 347-420. Archer, Gleason L., ed. Jerome's Commentary of Daniel Translation. Grand Rapids, Michigan, Baker Book House. Archived from the original on 26 May 2010. Retrieved 7 June 2010. McGinn, Bernard 1994. Antichrist, 2000 Years of the Human Fascination with Evil. New York, HarperCollins. Cabinet, Christopher Widholm and Bernard McGinn, 2001. Antichrist, an interview with Bernard McGinn. Cabinet Magazine. Issue 5 Evil Winter. Cabinet Magazine. Origin, 1872, 185-254. Writings of Origin, Volume 2. In Roberts, Rev. Alexander. Anti-Nicene Christian Library, Writings of the Fathers. 23. James Donaldson. Edinburgh, T&T Clark pp. 385-8. Retrieved 6 June 2010. Schaff, Philip, Schlie Schaff, David 1885. History of the Christian Church. Charles Scribner's Sons. Retrieved 18 January 2009. Topic further reading Cohn, Norman 1970. The Pursuit of the Millennium, Rev. and Expanded. Ed. New York, Oxford University Press. ISBN 9780195004517. Cohn, Norman 1878 Translator 2007. Martin Luther on the Antichrist. Lesquierd, Diggory. ISBN 9781846853. Cohn, Norman 1970. The Late, Great Planet Earth. Grand Rapids, Zondervan. ISBN 9780310277381. Cohn, Norman 1981. The Antichrist. Harrison, New York, Roman Catholic Books. ISBN 9780912141962. Cohn, Norman 1981. Wilhelm, Wilson, Robert McLaughlin, Trans, 2003. 
New Testament Apocrypha, Writings Relating to the Apostles, Apocalypses and Related Subjects, Volume 2 6th German Edition 1989, 1992, 2003 ed. S. L., Westminster John Knox. ISBN 9780664227227. Topic external links The Dictionary Definition of Antichrist at Wiktionary Quotations Related to Antichrist at Wikiquote Media Related to Antichrist at Wikimedia Commons of Antichrist and His Ruin 1692 by John Bunyan, online as part of the Acacia John Bunyan Online Library. Lerner, Robert E. The 22nd of March 2007. Antichrist. Encyclopedia Britannica online ed. Irenaeus, Trans, by Alexander Roberts and William Rambo. Against Heresies, Book V, Chapter 25. Anti-Nicene Fathers, Volume 1. Buffalo, New York, Christian Literature Publishing Co., 1885, revised and edited for New Advent by Kevin Knight. Ginsberg, Lewis, 1901-1906. Antichrist. In Singer, Isidore, et al. Jewish Encyclopedia. New York, Funk and Wagnalls Company. Lutheran scholarly works on the Antichrist Orthodox Wiki, Antichrist texts on Wikisource, Davidson, Samuel, 1878. Antichrist. Encyclopedia Britannica, 2, 9th ed. pp. 124 to 127. Bousset, Wilhelm, 1911. Antichrist. Encyclopedia Britannica, 1, 11th ed. pp. 121 to 123. Moss, Anthony John, 1907. Antichrist. Catholic Encyclopedia. 1. Antichrist. Easton's Bible Dictionary, 1897. Antichrist. Encyclopedia Biblica. 1. 1899. Nietzsche, Friedrich, 2006, 1918. The Antichrist, Curse on Christianity. Translated by Mencken, Henry Lewis.